Greetings to you in the name of Jesus. We have come to the second part of the Revelation series that I commenced in the foregone uh, section. And in that we studied the first three verses of Revelation 1. And today I am going to start from verse 4 of Revelation chapter 1. And as I said in the foregone uh, part, I am using the King James Version of the English Bible. Okay, verse 4 says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. My dear friends, quite amazingly we see the presence of uh, the Holy Trinity in these verses. Anyway, I'll try to explain one element after another uh, as uh, in detail as I can and we'll see what the Lord has in store for us today. Okay, now we know that from the last uh, section of uh, Revelation series that the writer is John, one of the disciples of Jesus who was in his old years having uh, served the Lord as a bishop in Ephesus, was arrested by the Roman government and uh, eventually he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Now he is writing, so it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now my dear friends, the recipients of the book of Revelation are the seven churches. Now, you have to bear with me until we come to the seven churches in uh, a later edition of our Revelation series, uh, but just just know that at this moment I will brief what the seven churches mean. There are three meanings to the seven churches of Asia. Number one, the absolute literal meaning. There existed seven churches by the names that are, that they are mentioned in Revelation chapters two and three in Asia Minor, which is present day Istanbul in Turkey. So these churches truly existed and today those places do exist although there are no more churches but, but ruins of churches. So primarily the recipients were the seven churches in Asia. But wait a minute, when I come to chapter 2 I will explain uh, how it is possible that they were, not only the, they were not the only recipients of the book of Revelation but all of us. Okay. The second meaning for the seven churches of uh, Revelation or from Asia Minor is that the historical era starting from the commencement of the church up until the time of the church going to be raptured till the time of the rapture of the church the era, the time span between these two are divided into seven, not equal but seven portions. And again when we talk about chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation I will explain the specific dates that separate these seven church ages. Now the third meaning of the seven churches uh, is associated with the, the, the meaning of the number seven. In the book of Revelation there are so many number sevens present. And number seven in biblical numerology is completeness. Now if you want to uh, just know a little bit of uh, biblical numerology, now I'm not going to talk about biblical numerology much because that's not uh, within the parameters of what we are talking here. Number one denotes God, number two separation, number three resurrection, number four Jesus, number five the power of God, number six man and number seven completion. Again, number one God, number two separation, number three resurrection, number four Jesus, number five the power of God and number six man and then number seven completion. So the seven churches in Asia represent the complete church. Every church, your church, my church and all the churches. So if we really try interpret this verse, it suggests that the book of Revelation has been written not only to the seven churches in Asia which are given by their names in this book but also to every single church that has existed in the past that are in existence today and that will spring up in the future until the time the church on the whole will be raptured to go to heaven. Okay, So John is writing to all the churches and it says grace be unto you and peace. 
not only here, but also in some other epistles, you would see that the writers of the epistles greet the recipients with the terms, may there be grace and peace unto you. Now, grace, the Greek for grace is charis, is the way the Greeks greet each other when they say, see each other, they greet saying charis. And peace, shalom, is the Hebrew word which, are, which is used by the Jews when they see each other. So John, in writing to every church, is now greeting them with these two words, grace and peace, charis and shalom, so that he could accommodate both the Gentiles and the Jews. So, this book, the book of Revelation, is not exclusively to the Jews, but to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And here we see that grace precedes uh, peace. So Gentiles are given more prominence over and above the Jews, not in any way to undermine the Jews, but to make the book of Revelation uh, very important to the Gentiles as well, and accommodating them and giving them a prominent place is uh, to show that not only the gospel, but also the future hope is for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Okay, my dear friends. Okay. From him which is, and which was, and which is to come. Now that talks about the Father. Now here we see that the Trinity is present. We know that the word Trinity does not exist in the Bible, in its text. But the concept is there. And here is one of, one of, one of the main important places where the Trinity is found. So firstly, the Father is <coughs> identified here as the one which is, and which was, and which is to come. In other words, our God is there today. He has been in the past. He never began. He never commenced. He has always been there. He is existing from the eternal past. And then he is going to be there eternally. So our Father, God the Father, uh, is there today. He was in the past and he will be in the future. And secondly, it says, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now my dear friends, this does not talk about seven, seven different spirits. But Referring to Isaiah chapter 11, of which we will talk about later in our series. This is a sevenfold spirit of God. This is none other than the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, firstly, greetings from the Father, in the name of the Father, and now in the name of the Spirit. And verse 5 talks about Jesus. And from Jesus Christ. Okay. Look at the Trinity, the Father. The Father is uh, identified here as the one who is, who was, and who is to come. And the Spirit, Holy Spirit, is identified he here as the sevenfold Spirit, as mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. And now, it talks about Jesus Christ, okay, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Okay, faithful witness of what? Witness of virtually everything because he is the Word. The Word is the witness for everything. For the creation, for the fall of man, for the restoration of man, for the sacrifice of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, for the salvation uh, that is given uh, to mankind, and for the, the, the eternal life that we are going to spend with God. Okay? So He is the faithful witness. He, if, if we know the Word of God, if we know Jesus, the, the, Jesus has expressed Himself through the Bible. Because he is the word of God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. So Jesus happens to be the faithful witness for everything. And then it says, the first begotten of the dead. Although many people rose again from the dead, both in the Old Testament and the New. In the Old Testament, two important people could come to our minds when we talk about resurrection. In the days of Elijah and Elisha. You remember when Elijah went to Tishbe in Sidon, the, the, the Shahifat, uh, uh, Elijah from Tishbe went to Shahifat in uh, Sidon, the Sharifat widow's son died and Elijah brought him back to life. Then in the story of Elisha, we see that the son of the Shunammite woman died and then Elisha brought him back to life. So, <clears throat> we see resurrection in the Old Testament. Then we see resurrection in the New Testament. For example, Jesus brought back a young girl who, did, who died to life. He said in Aramaic, Talitha Khumi, little girl, rise up. 
And then in John chapter 11, Jesus brought back to life Lazarus who was dead for four days. So long before Jesus rose again from the dead, people rose again from the dead both in the Old Testament and in the New. But the reason why this says that the first begotten of the dead is this. I'll tell you. The word begotten means sonship. Sonship. Look at this my dear friends. Before Jesus died and rose again from the dead, there was no concept of anyone being born again. It's only after Jesus and through Jesus that the concept of born again comes into play. If you are a Christian, you are born again, right? I am a Christian, born again. Now I was born to a biological mother and a biological father and then I became a Christian by accepting Jesus into my life as my personal savior and on that day I died to my old life and I was born again. Okay. On the same token, if you are a Christian, it doesn't matter whether you became a Christian from being a, a believer of another faith or whether you have been a Christian right through your life. At some point, you asked Jesus into your life and you became a Christian. And when you did that, you died to your own self and you were born again. Now my dear friends, if I remind you of Romans chapter 6 as to what Paul talks about when he talks about baptism, then you will understand what I am trying to say. In Romans chapter 6, Paul is saying, when we obey in waters of baptism, we die with Jesus. When we spend the, 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 the split seconds under the water when we are immersed, because we have to believe only in the immersion baptism, I don't have time to talk about the difference between the sprinkling baptism and um, immersion baptism. But I would like to just tell you that in 371 AD, sprinkling baptism was introduced. But, but, but then that's not biblical. Baptist so means immersion. Okay, When we spend the, the split seconds underwater, we are buried with Christ. And when we come out of that water, we are resurrected with Christ. So that baptism is the external or the outward expression of the inward belief and the restoration that we have received through Jesus Christ. So, re obeying in waters of baptism is the sign, external sign of somebody being born again. Now, the first person to have been born again became a Christian after the resurrection of Christ. Can you see that? Be it his disciples, be it anyone. Before Jesus died, the concept of being born again was mentioned by way of introduction by Jesus. Do you remember who Jesus told about born again? To Nicodemus. Remember in the Gospel of John. When Nicodemus asked a question from Jesus, Jesus said, Unless one is born again, he will not see the Father or go to heaven. Then he says, Lord, how can I be born again? Uh, because I'm an old man. How can I go back to my mother's womb? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. If you are not born again in spirit and in water, okay, then you will not see the kingdom of God. Now there, water does not talk about baptism. It talks about the word of God. And the spirit talks about the regenerating spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So one is quickened or resurrected or made born again by the Holy Spirit when he or she accepts Jesus as his or her personal savior. What I am trying to tell you is this. The practicality of one being able to be born again in water and spirit or the word and the spirit transpired only after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why here it says that Jesus was the first begotten of the dead. Can you see that? Right? Because it was Jesus' resurrection was not just another resurrection. Like Lazarus or like that little girl or like the son of the Sharifat woman or the son of the Shunammite woman. Okay? Jesus' resurrection brought the possibility of people to be born again into the sonship of Christianity by becoming sons of God. Okay? So that's why it says the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. There may be kings, but then Jesus supersedes all of them because he is the king of kings. Just because it says prince, don't think that here the prince is any, in any way 
inferior to the kings because usually a prince is inferior to the king right because usually if there is a king the king's son is called the prince but in this case it's not like that it says it's another way of expressing that jesus is the king of kings and then also it goes on to say unto him that loved us wow the love of jesus of course the father loved us john 3 16 talks about that doesn't it for god so loved the world uh, he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life now that's the love of the, love of the father but it's the love of jesus that caused jesus to endure all the hardships that he endured to die on that cross and be uh, rose again uh, for us so unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood wow 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 say so how many things this jesus has done to us to be cleansed from all the sin and then to become the sons of god verse 6 lovely verse it's a very sentimental verse i'll tell you it's a very sentimental verse at least for me and hath made us kings and priests unto god and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Wow. John says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Of course, God is the Father of Jesus, right? And hath made us kings and priests. Look at us. Who are we? What do we deserve to be saved? My dear friends, let me talk about myself. I was born to a Hindu family. I was worshipping 330 million gods and goddesses. As a Hindu, I was a nature worshipper. In other words, I worshipped the creation because I didn't know the creator. I never thought that I would one day meet my creator. That one day I would be introduced to my real creator. I lived as a Hindu and I lived as somebody who didn't know the true God. But way back in 1979, when I was still an anti-Christian, when I still despised the God of the white man, quote and unquote, the love of Jesus came to me in the form of a pastor who came and preached the gospel to me. I became a Christian. Look at me today. I am not just a Christian. I am a servant of God. I am a servant of Jesus. And Jesus says, if any man serves me, him will my father honor you know, God the Father honors me, not because I have any good in me, not because I am in any way appreciable, in any way good, no. But because I serve Jesus. Jesus called me to his service. Why did he call, call me? Is it because he can do anything through me? No. God called me to the ministry because of his love. Jesus called me into his ministry because of his love. And because of his love to a heathen like me, a sinner like me, today I have been made a king and a priest to God. Wow! Can you see that? Of course there are so many religions in the world. And uh, those so-called gods have never made any of their believers kings. But our God has made us kings and priests. I'll beat the fact that we don't deserve to even be his mere believers. We must be grateful to our God for his immense love and for making us what we don't deserve to become. Wow. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is uh, the expression of John. The expression of John's gratitude and so should it be in our lives. Verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him even so amen behold he cometh with clouds uh, i i believe that this is an allusion to daniel chapter 7 because uh, now i'm teaching you only the book of revelation i'm not teaching you eschatology eschatology is a study of last of the last days i am not teaching you the last days although the last days play a very prominent part in the book of Revelation. Now, if I am teaching eschatology, then I would teach Daniel chapter 7 also. Okay? But because I'm not teaching eschatology, but the book of Revelation, which contains eschatology, I'm not going to deal with Daniel chapter 7 and verse 11. Just, just remember, 
Just remember that Daniel chapter 7 uh, talks about Jesus coming in the cloud with the clouds and this is similar to that perhaps this is an allusion to daniel chapter 7 behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him uh, shall see him right now that is an allusion to zechariah 12 10 again i don't have uh, i don't i don't have to teach you zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 because zechariah also talks about uh, the eschatological events but then again we are not studying eschatology per se we are studying the book of revelation okay they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him let me talk about each of the expressions in verse 7 behold now now john is excited he's saying look you know he saw these things in a vision in my first episode, I explained how he saw things, right, in, vis in a vision. So he saw these in a vision. Wow, how excited uh, he would have been. He saw in the vision the second coming of Jesus. Now, my dear friends, in our studies, uh, we will talk about two comings of Jesus. One, the, the, the secret coming of Jesus, the rapture. And then the, the real second coming of Jesus. Now, this talks about the second coming of Jesus. Behold, oh, look, look, he's coming. He cometh with clouds, right? He's coming. Um, he's coming with the uh, hosts. And uh, clouds doesn't need to mean just this, these clouds that, that are in the sky. Of course, this also talks about the clouds. Uh, in the clouds, on the clouds, with the clouds. But also with uh, clouds of angelic beings. The angels who, who, who perhaps from here look like uh, the cloud, right? So he's coming with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him uh, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now my dear friends, I'm going to explain something very important here. Every eye shall see him. Now how everybody on earth will see the second coming, I don't know. Now, there are teachers who teach that uh, they will see through television, live telecast, or through, now, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know how everybody uh, from all over the globe would tune in to the television to see something. I don't know. But every eye will see. I don't know how God is going to make uh, everybody see. But we are talking about a time when the church is absent. I'll explain why. When it say, although it says that they also which pierced him, who pierced Jesus, two kinds of people, the Jews, by giving Jesus over to the Romans to be crucified, they pierced Jesus, right? Because the crucifixion involved piercing uh, in, in, in the hands and in the foot. So the Jews pierced, although they did not directly do it, they were the ones who were, in, in, who were instrumental in the piercing of Jesus. But also you remember, when Jesus was already dead, there was this Roman soldier who came and pierced his side. Water and blood flowed through the wound to show that Jesus was really dead. So the Romans were also those who pierced. So it says that the Romans and the Jews will also see. Okay, And all the kindreds of the earth, look at this, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Wail is not a positive connotation, not a positive word there. It says when they see Jesus come back, they are going to wail, lament, cry. If Christians are part of those people, they will not cry, would they? They will not wail, would they? So this suggests a time when the Christians are not on this earth. Where would they be? Praise God. They would have already been raptured and they, they, they would be in heaven when Jesus comes with his angels in his second coming. Okay? So in... in uh, time to come in our series we will talk about the second coming of Jesus as to with who he'll come and who we'll see and what will happen uh, at a later time okay right now he's so excited he started by saying behold look and he finishes by saying even so amen yes yes let it happen we see throughout the book of Revelation an excited John okay and I, I, I hope I don't know whether you are sensing that excitement in me it is there. I don't know whether you can see it through the camera, the lenses of the camera. But I invite you to be excited to study the book of Revelation. Because there are so many exciting things that we are going to learn. Now, coming to verse 8 where Jesus is starting to talk in the book of Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. 
my dear friends i want to explain a superb thing here okay now if we revert to verse 4 there in the greeting from him which is and which was and which is to come refers to the father right but in verse 8 the one who says i am alpha and omega the beginning and the end is the one who is called which is and which was and which is to come the almighty can you can you see it can you get it in verse 4 the father is called which is which was and which is to come but in verse 8 the same expression is attributed to jesus how do we know we know through the book of revelation that the alpha and omega refers to jesus christ in in verse 4 which is and which was and which is to come refers to the father and in verse 8 the alpha and omega is referred to as which is which was and which is to come in other words by the time john comes to verse 8 he uses the words of jesus himself that attest to the fact that jesus was the father jesus is the almighty i and my father are one said jesus when he was on this earth yes there are two different persons the father did not die on the cross jesus did but nonetheless it's the same person personality the same god in three persons and in this case the almighty god which is which was and which is to come happens to be jesus himself and using the expression alpha and, and omega is to show that he is the beginning and the end because that was the way in which uh, they explained the, the beginning and the end of something the, the hebrew the first letter of hebrew is aleph the last letter is tau so many jewish rabbis when talking about something that commences and end, end use the expression from aleph to tau and in this case jesus uses the same phraseology only changing the letters from hebrew into greek alpha and omega in a in a in a, in a way as i said in the first study it's an abstract uh, command to john to write everything in greek so i am alpha and omega the beginning and the ending um, beginning and the ending and alpha alpha and omega does not merely mean that he has existed in the past and he will exist in the future but but it will it it also means that he is the originator of everything in the beginning and he is the sustainer of everything to the eternal future okay now verse 9 i john who also am your brother and the companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of jesus christ was in the isle that is called the patmos for the word of god and for the testimony of jesus christ john is explaining why he is where he is he says he is in the isle of patmos it's a volcan it's a volcanic uh, island no trees very rocky mosquito infested island and uh, if you the, the, the size of the island would be about 6 uh, by 10 miles okay 6 by 10 uh, miles and uh, it was uh, about 30 miles southwest of uh, samos okay and uh, usually the romans sent a lot of not not a lot but a few inferior uh, prisoners to that island to suffer uh, loneliness and eventually they'll die because no people lived there only mosquitoes volcanic rocky island hmm not a very good place now john was there why he says he says because of the word of god and for the testimony of jesus christ because he was serving the lord he was preaching and uh, he was um, witnessing for jesus and obviously all the apostles were killed and uh, john was now exiled in the isle of patmos right and he's calling himself the brother of every uh, christian and he's saying companion in tribulation here the tribulation does not mean the great tribulation the tribulation john was uh, enduring in the times uh, of uh, the, the the romans persecuting the, the the christian church in the first century so he's saying uh, uh, he he is uh, suffering for jesus christ etc etc my dear friends why would god allow john a patmos experience 
I want to talk about it. Couldn't God have uh, saved him from being thrown into the Isle of uh, Patmos? Now there is a tradition, I don't know. It's not historically substantiated, but, but there is a tradition that holds that John was at one point immersed into a boiling oil barrel, a barrel of boiling oil. Still, he survived. And I don't know, I don't know whether it's true because it's not a legitimate historical account, it's a tradition. And uh, it, it could have been true. But whatever it is, it suggests that uh, God protected John from heavy, severe persecution. Now, we know that during the time of the book of the Acts itself, the disciples of Jesus who had become apostles were beginning to die. James was beheaded in the book of Acts, right? And then if we look at uh, the lives of the other apostles. Now, Judas Iscariot died right after betraying Jesus. Now, he never became an apostle. He's not in this list. But then we have the rest of the disciples, 11. And then we have Paul. Uh, all of them, but John died long before John wrote uh, the book of Revelation. Now, that tells me that John could also have been killed, but God protected him. So, if God could protect him from dying, prevent John from being thrown into the Isle of Patmos. I'll tell you why. Now I looked into the life of John through some secular documentations, uh, uh, documents uh, that support the idea of what John has been doing. He was a busy man. Being a bishop and especially in a very acclaimed uh, rich place called Ephesus, he was very busy for the Lord. He was sharing the gospel, he was edifying the young ministers, nurturing them, mentoring them, looking after the church and many other churches that were under his uh, presbytery, etc. He was a very busy man. For the Lord, for the Lord. In a good way. But, sometimes, people become so busy for the Lord, that they don't have time to listen to the Lord. Now, God had a huge plan of revealing stuff to John, and God expected John to sit and write the book of Revelation. The Apocalypse is. Without which we wouldn't be here. We are studying the book of Revelation. Thankfully given to us through John, right? Now God wanted John to write the book of Revelation. Now for that, God needed John to give God some time to sit and listen to God, to see those visions. But John was too busy serving the Lord and therefore he did not have time to listen to the Lord. So God may have allowed the Romans to capture John and throw him to the Isle of Patmos. And in the Isle of Patmos, John had nothing to do. So God used that isolation in the life of John to reveal things to him. In our lives too, my dear friends. In my life, in my life, I have seen. that there are so many good things that uh, take up a lot of our time. Good things, godly things. We are so busy with churches. I am very busy with my church. I am very busy with my Bible college. I am very busy counseling people, praying for people. I am very busy traveling all around the world, uh, conducting conferences, speaking appointments, and then making videos for televisions like this, etc., etc. I am so busy. In a very good way. I am not idling. I am not wasting my time. But hang on a minute. Do I give my God time for Him to talk to me? Many people become caught up in a lot of work. And they don't have the time for God. For God to talk to them. And if that's the case, sometimes God has to allow the Isle of Patmos experience in our lives. Sometimes God allows some sicknesses into my life. And I become bedridden. And in those times, God speaks to me. And later on, after I uh, receive the healing and I am up and about, I thank the Lord for the time that I spent uh, in bed because God would talk to me. Even in your lives, my dear friends, if at times God permits situations where you are cornered, where you are sort of arrested, not by the legal institutions, but you know when you are when you don't when you are unable to do anything, you are you are just cornered. Allow the Lord to minister to you. There may be times that the Lord talks to you. There may be your times in the Isle of Patmos in your own little way for God to be able to talk to you in His power, authority and prerogative. Okay? Right. Now let's go to verse, verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day 
and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. I was in the spirit. Okay, I was in the spirit. It's a term which is uh, to denote uh, being in union with the Holy Spirit and yielding unto Him. Okay, now my dear friends, He abstractly says that He is all vision. That's exactly what happened to John. He was in the Isle of Patmos and on the Lord's day, he was in the spirit. Right? Now that spirit is the Holy Spirit. He was taken control by the Holy Spirit. He began to receive the revelations through the Holy Spirit. Now that's what it means. Okay? Uh, on the Lord's day, when was it? Was it Saturday or Sunday? We know that Shabbat was the, the Lord's day in the Old Testament for the Jews. So was this Saturday? No, my dear friends, this was Sunday. Why? I'll explain to you something. There are those who are very adamant about uh, the day of the Lord and the Lord's Shabbat. Many are very insistent that the Shabbat should be on Saturday because it was held on Shabbat. And the fourth commandment of the Decalogue, uh, the, the Ten Commandments, uh, say that the Lord's day Shabbat should be held by everyone. But we must understand that the apostles, after starting the church, made the Lord's day Sunday. Because Jesus rose again on Sunday. The, the disciples who became apostles were Jews. So obviously they held Shabbat as well on Saturday. But for them, the Lord's day was Sunday. We have enough historical records, legitimate ones, to show that the Lord's Day had become Sunday from the time the church started. Now many people say that Sunday became the Lord's Day after Constantine. Yes, Constantine issued an edict in 321 AD that the day of the church or the day of the Lord for Christians should be Sunday. Now, it's true. But because of that, many people think that Constantine made Sunday the Lord's Day. No. Sunday would have been, was, it was a holiday for the Romans. That's a different story. But long before Constantine made the edict in 321 AD that Sunday should be the day of the Lord for the Christians, the Christians, starting from the time of the apostles, from the commencement of the church, had used Sunday as the Lord's Day. So my dear friends, the day of the Lord, the Lord's Day, that uh, John is talking about in verse 10, is not Saturday, but Sunday. Okay? Now he heard a voice from behind him, a great voice. Okay? It was like a, a trumpet. Because for them a trumpet was a very loud, but a beautiful noise. Okay? It was loud, but beautiful saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia. And then Jesus, Jesus is the one who is talking, and he's naming the churches, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Theatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Okay, my dear friends, as I said, these seven churches truly existed in those places. Even today, these places are there in Istanbul, in Turkey, but uh, they are just ruins. Uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea were cities in Asia Minor where churches existed and the primary recipient, recipients of the book of Revelation happened to be those people. But then we know that secondarily, the church era from the time the church started till the time the church is going to be raptured is divided into seven segments and the first segment is similar to the church in Ephesus and the second segment is similar to the church in Smyrna and so on and so forth. And the third, third meaning of these seven churches is every church because number seven connotes completion. So my dear friends, Today we have uh, studied from verse uh, 4 all the way to verse 11. Okay, Now, in our third section, <clears throat> in our 
series. In our third part, we are going to start from verse 12 onwards and we are going to see what John saw. Because it starts by saying, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And then he goes on to explain how Jesus looked. And the way Jesus looked signifies a lot of things that we are going to uh, ponder upon in our next episode. So my dear friends, I believe you are enjoying uh, this series on Revelation. You may not necessarily agree with me on everything. I don't want you to agree with me on everything. Right? Just allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. And uh, as you see, I have done a lot of research. But then it's not the ultimatum. I'm not very dogmatic on certain things. And uh, may God bless you and keep you until we meet in our third part of this Revelation series. May who, he, who is, who was, and who is to come keep you and bless you until then. Bye.